anything. Should we get started? Yeah, let's get started. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Scott Davis, and this is the kickoff. Um, this is a new webinar series. This is our very first one, so I'm very happy to have all of you here today. Um, before I do introductions, I'd like to take a minute and give a little background on why we're doing this, what the kickoff is, what it isn't, um, and then we'll take it from there. So, um, next slide, please. So what is the kickoff? It is a webinar series for executive recruiters um, and also executive search firms. If you do um, general recruiting, maybe non-executive roles, I do think you, you will get a lot out of um, the webinar, particularly today, but the focus is really on executive search firms, um, kind of that white glove uh, type of model. Um, at the end of the day, Clockwork does make software, um, but if you look at kind of the rest of the day, you'll find that we actually have a lot of industry expertise in-house. Our CEO and founder used to be an executive recruiter. Um, Thaddeus, who's joining me today, is he has over a decade working in the industry, doing marketing for the industry. Um, so we're gonna leave the demo at the door for this webinar series. If you're here for a demo, um, the Q&A is open and you can say, I'd love a demo and leave your name and, and phone number and we'll get one of our account executives to, to follow up. Um, they are way better at getting, giving demos than I am and certainly can answer your product questions um, in much more detail. Um, so the focus here is really on sharing that industry expertise that we have in house. Um, and, and really, you know, whether it's methodology tips, what, what can we share that we have seen um, to help um, all of us do better search? Um, we do also have a lot of connections in the industry from our partners that we work with to just thought leaders in the industry. And so our hope is to have a special guest on this webinar every time. We think we'll probably do this every two months. Um, but with that, that's what the kickoff is really all about. And today's guests are myself and Thaddeus Andres. Thaddeus, why don't you give a little introduction and background on, on what you've been doing in this industry? Sure, thanks for that, Scott. So hi everyone, I'm Thaddeus Andres. I've been within the executive search space for about 12 or 13 years at this point. Um, I started my career as kind of a database administration marketing um, administrator at the Association of Executive Search Consultants. That was back in 2010, then moved into kind of the executive search side, working for a global executive search firm called IIC Partners, where we serviced, I think it was around 40 offices at that point. Um, so I helped them with all of their marketing best practices, really drove the marketing strategy at the global brand level as well, and then helped all those search firms across the globe and search consultants specifically, target clients, help with their marketing materials, all of that. And then around 2017, 2018, I decided to pivot my career and I kind of moved into the technology space of executive search. So I worked for a handful of global technology companies specifically that made software for executive search firms. Um, and then after that, I kind of forayed into creating and launching my own business, which is Retainly. So Retainly is marketing for executive search firms. Over the last 10 years before I launched it, I saw a real gap within the marketplace, specifically for search firms in terms of marketing. Um, and really the approach for marketing from a search perspective is really kind of turn it on when we need it and then just let it fall by the wayside or put it on the back burner, you know, once once we get busy and once we get ramped up with more searches, which if you think about it, isn't really a strategy. It should always be on, it should always be working for you and it should always be generating more searches and more leads for you. So I kind of saw that gap within the marketplace. And then about two years ago, I launched Retainly, which again is a marketing agency, if you will, for search firms. And we do marketing strategy. We look at what works, today, what's worked in the past, what's not working, and then kind of create and build a marketing strategy moving forward 
and keeping it turned on for the duration of kind of the engagement that we work with our search firms. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. Um, but Scott, did you want to kind of walk into what, what our topic is for, for next? Sure. So I, so first of all, I'm actually the, the VP of marketing at clockwork. I didn't get to introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm kind of one of those behind the scenes marketers. So for me to be on the webinar today is I'm, I guess I'm outside of my comfort zone or at the least, this is my debut. Uh, but nonetheless, I really like today's uh, topic, not just because it's marketing, but um, I think it's very timely and uh, it's been an interesting start of the year for the industry. And uh, so Thaddeus, why don't you walk us through what is what is today's topic? Why is it timely and, and what we're going to cover today? Sure. So today's topic, everyone, is marketing and business development for search firms. You know, Q1, which we're almost towards the end of for 2023, has been an interesting time because for most search firms, from what I've seen over the last decade, is Q1 is always one of the busiest times of year. You know, Q1 is a place and a time where client companies have the strategy built out from a human capital perspective. They have their headcount approved. They have everything that they need to really set the course for the entire year. But this year's been different. Like there's been a lot of uncertainty with kind of the SVP, SVB um, collapse and that sort of thing. So there's not really a whole lot of activity from a search perspective, but there is work out there. Search firms I talk to say there's work out there, but no one's really, you know, advancing forward. Searches aren't progressing forward. Everything is just kind of possibly on hold, something along those lines. So Again, kind of the topic for today is how to A, market your search firm and market your expertise and your specialization. And then we will also kind of walk into how to market a pre-search offering. So the example that we will use today is market mapping. And we'll explain what that is a little bit later during the webinar. Um, but really the whole topic is to kind of use those market mapping um, additional services or kind of pre-search offerings. It doesn't have to be market mapping. It can be leadership advisory. It can be succession planning. It can be pre-search strategy. It can be executive coaching. Really what we're talking about today is applicable to all of those pre-search offerings. And those pre-search offerings, as you know, is really a way to get your search firm in the door for a client or kind of get your search firm in in place ready to ready to kick off a search once it's ready you know six a couple of months down the line so scott thinking about marketing and and kind of where a search firm should start what's the baseline for it talk to me a little bit about kind of why a search firm should specialize why that's important in their marketing um, i would love to learn more about that Certainly. Um, first, I noticed there's actually a couple of questions that have come in already. So I do want to mention because I, I forgot in the housekeeping, this is being recorded and we will send the recording out to everyone that's registered, whether you attend or not, we're going to send it to everybody. Um, so if you do need to jump early, feel free. Um, you'll, you'll be able to, to watch the recording. Um, also, thank you for asking the questions already. We will probably hold um, any other questions, at least non-housekeeping questions until, until the end and answer all those together. Um, so specialization, I think it's a great place to start. It really is the foundation here. Um, you know, I think a lot of search firms, they know what their specialty is, or they have some idea of it in, in their head, but it's, it can be very, um, productive to, to write it down, to really think about it, um, for a minute. Um, the principle here is simple. If you know what work you're good at, then you know where to look to find more work. Um, so let's talk about what, what is specialization? What are the areas of specialization? Um, we consider these five areas of specialization. Some people combine some, sometimes they use a different name for them, but generally um, we see this is pretty consistent across this industry. Um, the first of which is industry. And so, you know, for what what industries do you do great search in is the question you need to ask yourself. 
it can be consumer goods, it can be the tech industry, it can be manufacturing. Um, but knowing that, and, and this probably is the biggest one, knowing what industry um, you have the contacts in as a consultant, you, you know that th you can do great work in that industry. And if a search comes along outside of that industry, you know that, hey, maybe that's not a good fit um, or it's going to take more time to complete that search. Um, so that's that's really the idea of these areas of specialization. But uh, let's cover let's cover some of the other ones very quickly. Um, location or geography, where is the role going to be or is it remote? Um, seniority, um, a lot of search firms specialize in just board searches. Um, for them, it might be challenging to do a VP level search um, or vice versa. If you if you do a lot of VP level searches, it, it would probably take you time to find um, somebody for a board. Um, company stage or size, really think of this as kind of the company profile, not just how many employees they have, but you know, what's the revenue, what's their funding status. Um, oftentimes search firms will focus on, you know, pre IPO and startups, or they might focus on fortune 500 companies, or maybe even large private companies. Um, and last but not least department, this is really the organizational function. You know, is it a sales marketing finance role? Um, also very important. If you know, um, if you specialize in CFOs in the Bay area for tech companies, then. Um, that tells you what a good target for your business development is. Um, it also tells you what's not a good target for your business development. And if you have to kind of step outside along one of these axes, you know, like, okay, maybe I can um, take on a role in, in LA as long as everything else is the same. Um, so that's really why this is key to um, business development and really internalizing what your specialization is. Now, you can have more than one specialization for sure. Certainly if your search firm grows and maybe you bring in another partner, you merge with another search firm, um, you're gonna have more and more um, areas of specialization that you can take on. Um, but the, the principle is, is still the same even for very large search firms. Perhaps it's not what areas they specialize in, but what areas they don't specialize in at some point. But you also want to keep in mind, don't fall into the trap of being a generalist. Um, if it's too far outside of your area of expertise, it really is best if you refer the search to someone else. You'll end up spending too much time iterating with the client on strategies. You'll spend too much time doing research because you don't have the contacts in that industry or location. Um, and ultimately, you'll be able to do two searches in your own specialization um, in the amount of in the amount of time that it takes to do a search that's really outside of 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 your area so it even makes business sense to focus on your your specialization so with that that's kind of the our foundation um thaddeus now that we we know what our area of specialization is um what what do we do with that what's next yeah, so once we know our area of specialization in terms of geography, location, function, all of that that you mentioned, Scott, it's time to build a target list. And that target list really needs to encompass a very, very fine-tuned list of key contacts that you will be engaging with. So look to past referenceable clients client competitors, identify those decision makers at those competitors, and add those people to your list. The key to kind of really creating an effective marketing list from a search firm perspective is identifying those stakeholders so that you immediately have access and exposure in front of them instead of kind of a more junior personal person on their team that then has to up level kind of your, your communication, your email, something along those lines. So look at, you know, who are the decision makers? Who are the stakeholders within these organizations? Look to refer referenceable placements. We all know that sometimes candidates can, can become clients. So if you placed a candidate six months ago and they're very happy and they've gotten their feet wet and they're ready to make some changes at the leadership level, reach out to them, add them to your target market list. Um, look to industry influencers that you regularly check in with or kind of have standing standing calls with and just keep your ear to the ground thinking about, you know, 
if they say offhand that, you know, XYZ is looking for a new kind of CFO, something along those lines, COO, um, it's important to keep those individuals and those influencers close to you so that you do have kind of that exposure from an internal kind of, you know, confidential aspect of, of working within your target market list. So again, referenceable clients, past clients, client competitors, and that could be, you know, looking within your own search firms database and looking to what clients are also within kind of either that pharmaceutical or marketing space or life sciences space, something along those lines and using your own information, your own data to create this target market list. Um, and again, you know, identifying those decision makers, referenceable plus past placements, like candidates um, and those industry influencers. So that's really how you create this target market list. But then what do you do with it? You know, like you have this list in place, you can do outreach, um, which we'll get to in a little bit, but before you start cold calling, before you start dialing for dollars, um, what I recommend to, for search firms to do and for search consultants to do is to start building your expertise. And that really is kind of, the foundation for your marketing outreach. It's really what creates kind of your expert trusted advisor level within the organization and within the community within that you're targeting. So first think about where do your clients live? Obviously they're on their email, they're on their phone, that kind of thing. But chances are a lot of them spend a lot of their time on LinkedIn. So what I encourage search firms and search consultants to do is post to social media on a regular basis, just to build a following and establish that credibility so that it creates initial value awareness and gives context to prospects before you do that outreach, before you start calling them, before you start directly emailing them and, and kind of pitching your services. Um, so again, you're building up to that outreach phase of the marketing process and establishing these new touch points in a place that they spend a lot of time. Now, LinkedIn is just one example of kind of how to build that expertise out. It's part of your entire marketing strategy, which also includes website, landing pages, blog posts, email marketing, everything along those lines. All of that should work together to support your outreach when you're ready to go forward and kind of present and pitch yourself as a trusted advisor within this space and why the client should specifically work with you. So building through target lists creates engagement, likes and shares on social media such as LinkedIn. Um, and you can use those kind of engagements within that target market list as well. So even though LinkedIn will keep kind of your content and your marketing strategy within the LinkedIn space, as we all know they love to do, um, you can create a list within LinkedIn and then specifically reach those people on LinkedIn by commenting back, by direct messaging them, that kind of thing. Um, but also it's important to look past your individual engagements in terms of likes and shares and comments and look to your own competitors. Now, this is something that not a lot of search firms or search consultants think about. They think, okay, I can you know, engage with and react with people that have commented on my posts and that sort of thing. Um, but if you think about it, if you follow your client, if you follow your competitors within this, within this space or competing search firms within this space, chances are if they are on social media trying to build out that reputation, build out that presence, you also have access and visibility into who is liking their posts, who is sharing their posts, who is commenting on their posts. And you can use that within that target marketing list as well, because chances are your competitors are trying to reach very similar targets that you are. Um, so we start with the target market list after we've identified our specialization. And then we set the groundwork with all these kind of much smaller marketing strategies and much smaller pieces within the marketing wheel. Um, and then after we've kind of built this credibility and kind of established these new touch points, what we then move on is to the actual outreach. So Scott, would you mind kind of walking us through what the outreach looks like in terms of pitching your services and that sort of thing? 
Uh, certainly. And, you know, outreach is definitely where it, it becomes perhaps more of an art and less of a science. But really what it comes down to is, do you have an established relationship with the with the person you're, you're reaching out to? Um, if it's a, you know, a reference, referenceable client or even a, a referenceable placement, um, you should be connecting with them on a regular basis already. If not, there's uh, it's you know there's no time like the present um, doesn't hurt to reconnect rebuild that relationship and if you have a have a relationship there you can even um, be more straightforward in your outreach um, you you can even be you know somewhat hat in hand saying hey I'm looking to take on a new project do you have work do you know um, of other movement in the in the industry maybe uh, you you know somewhere else. Um, I think that's that's fair. Now, if you don't have that relationship, and I, I think certainly the first time you build a, a target market list, you're going to have a lot of people on there that maybe you haven't talked to. Um, and so you need to kind of build that relationship first. You need to establish your credibility. And that's really why um, what Thaddeus was just talking about, this you, you might consider it ancillary marketing, but it's actually kind of core to the strategy here. Um, if you reach out to somebody, um, you get them on the phone, they never heard of you. It's, it's going to be a tough conversation, but if they've seen you've been active, um, in their space on, on LinkedIn, posting about, um, your area of specialization, even, um, it establishes your credibility and it makes that phone call, um, go much easier. And, uh, you know, even if they, they say no, they'll be much more open to you following up, um, in, you know, three, six months. Um, so really, that's why that other marketing work is key and where it really comes into play. Um, another thing you can do, and we're going to talk about this a lot more in just a few minutes, is, is to offer um, something of value instead of going straight into a search project that they might not be ready for. Um, certainly, while you're on, on the phone, you are an expert in this industry and what's going on there. Provide that industry insight, um, provide information on what, what the talent landscape looks like. Um, that'll go a long way, particularly with a new uh, relationship that you're trying to build that, hey, not only do you have the, the credibility, but you're on, you're on their side. Um, you truly are trying to be a consultant and offer value for them. Um, so I've included on this slide, Bant, it is a, a very classic um, sales technique. I bring it up here because I think it's it's very powerful because it's easy to keep it in your head. And uh, you, even in the middle of a phone call, you can you can think about these four things. Bant is, a, is an acronym for budget, authority, need, and timing. Um, very simply, when, when you're in a conversation, you kind of want to evaluate these four things to kind of gauge um, the opportunity to essentially qualify the opportunity. Um, you know, has, is, is there budget for um, hiring a search firm? That's a, a great question to get an answer to. Um, is there a budget um, for even ma making the hire um, along the same lines there? Um, now there's a little shortcut here with authority. If, if you've done the work, if you've really internalized your specialization, you've built your target market list, then authority should actually be solved already. You should be talking to the right people, but certainly you wanna make sure you, that, that you are talking to the decision maker. And if for some reason you're not, you, 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 know, you know you need to get to that person. Um, need is often kind of a binary one, either they're, they're looking to, to make, the, make the hire or not. Um, what it's often coupled with though is the timing. So they might not need it now, but they they see needing it in six months. And um, thinking about Bant um, on the call, it it helps kind of guide what the next step is. Um, if if they're looking to make a placement in six months, um, then then perhaps there's something you can offer in the meantime. And that's a good segue here for Thaddeus, who's going to talk about um, market mapping. Thaddeus. Thanks, Scott. So just looking at this kind of band graphic here, before we get into kind of the whole how do you position and how you market market mapping as a service to your clients, market mapping, um, you're solving for 
one to two of these items within this band structure that are not there. So with market mapping, you have either a need that they don't necessarily have quite yet that you can fulfill six months from now, or you can also solve for time. So they don't necessarily have the time to start doing this market mapping exercise or really focus on building out the leadership strategy. So market mapping really solves for those two things that are missing within this BANT category. So moving on and thinking about, you know, market mapping itself, what is it? You know, we've heard about it. Some search firms provide it. It's a pre-search service that you can offer to your clients that essentially is the entire research strategy of search itself. So essentially what you're doing is you will go to a client. You can say, um, you know, there's a lot of movement in the industry. You might not have a hiring need right now or a new executive you need to appoint right now or within the next month. Um, so let's do this. Let's look at your competitor structures. Let's build a map that looks at three different levels. So director, VP, and C-level and really understand, you know, what skills gaps your organization is facing, how your competitors are structured, identifying any of those emerging leaders. Say, for example, if there's a director level um, candidate that's been at a company for four, five, six years and is ready to move on in, in their career, but there's no real room for growth at that organization, identifying those emerging leaders with market mapping is another way to kind of create a talent pool, create a pipeline of qualified talent for your client just six months ahead. So usually market mapping itself, like I said, is that research phase of an entire executive search and it's done over the course of about six months. So you start kind of with a strategy. You say, we're gonna look at these competitors. We're gonna look at these organizations. We're gonna target these specific levels, go up a level, go down a level and really kind of build this entire map of what available talent is out there and, and how it can fit into your organization about six months from now. So that's what market mapping is. Again, kind of the way that we're talking about it in terms of positioning it to clients, you can do this and you can use all these marketing strategies for leadership development, leadership advisory, succession planning, any sort of pre-search service offering that your search firm offers, you are more than welcome to apply any of these marketing tactics to those pre-search service offerings just to get yourself in the door before there is a need for a search. So how do you pitch market mapping? How do you position it to your clients? There's a couple of different ways you can do that. First, you can position it as strengthening future talent pipelines. So it is kind of a succession planning adjacent, adjacent um, function, but it's looking more towards the future. Six months from now, a year ago, where is the talent in the market going to be? And when will they be ready to make a move into kind of their next career level, next career step? You can also use it for succession planning, like, like I mentioned. Um, it enables your client to always be business ready. Say, for example, if they have plans to launch a new area of the business or a new revenue stream or even a new product, but they're not quite ready to do so yet, market mapping affords them the opportunity and the ability to look in the talent marketplace, identify who they want to onboard, who they want as part of their team, once they're ready to bring that service, bring that product to the market, and then maintain a relationship with those candidates specifically. As we all know, executive search and, and search firms are really based upon relationship building. That's why your clients hire you. Um, so if you position this market mapping exercise as a pre-search service, you are then engaging with this talent six months before a search need even arises. And again, as you know, you're engaging on behalf of your clients. So instead of you know a search being ready to go and then only having two to three months to do it, you've already nurtured those relationships. You've already built those relationships with talent that your client wants to hire essentially. Again, you can also identify any leadership or skills gaps within your organization or your client's organization. So looking at competitor structures, how many levels of leadership, how many levels of management do they have? 
what specific departments are larger, you know, what specific skills do they hire for initially, and then applying that to your client's organizational structure and organizational design in order to pinpoint, you know, your client, your competitors have X, Y, Z in terms of leadership skills and that sort of thing. Have you thought about applying that to your own structures, either with um, leadership development, executive coaching, hiring for a new kind of leadership position in that place? It's really effective for identifying those skills gap internally for your clients, which again can result in a search for six months from now. Now, on the other side of things, it's another tool that search firms can use to do a little bit of market research about how their client is perceived within kind of the workforce. We all have been there where we've kind of mentioned a client name or a company name and candidates kind of kind of pull back a little bit. So it really can be used as a market research tool to really kind of dip into and tap into how candidates are perceiving your clients in the marketplace. And then taking that information back to your clients saying, this is how the market perceives you. You know, these are the challenges you're up against. This is how you can change this within your employee value proposition. You know, these are the things you need to focus on from a candidate perspective, a talent attraction perspective, because there's these kind of differing opinions about your organization within the talent marketplace. And then again, finally, it's kind of, you can position market mapping as one of those nurturing relationships with emerging talent. Again, like I mentioned earlier, if a director level is not quite ready to move up within their current organization, or not quite able to move up within their current organization, creating those relationships, building those relationships, so that when A, your client is ready to make that appointment and start that search six months from now, you've already identified a, an emerging leader who is ready to move into that space as well and be a part of that role, be a part of that organization and, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what mar market mapping is. That's how you pitch it. Who do you target? We kind of already talked about that at the very beginning of this call target prospects that are, at, that are a good fit. We've all been and worked with those clients that are not a good fit. So part of really building out that target market list is identifying the companies and the organizations and even the candidates that you want to work for that you know will be a good fit. Um, again, looking at referenceable clients, client competitors, past place candidates, those are all part of building that target market list like we talked about and then reaching them through social media, email marketing, content, video, everything along those lines. All of that builds up to building your credibility within the marketplace and establishing that trusted advisor expertise level so that once you do that outreach, once you email, once you make that call, once you have that initial kind of discovery conversation, you've laid the groundwork. And then kind of moving into how to price market mapping. I know a lot of search firms that don't really offer market mapping as a pre-search consulting service. They, they kind of struggle with how to price this out. And from what I've seen in, in my experience working with search firms is usually what they do is they'll offer this market mapping project for the course of six months. And what they'll do is they'll say, hey, we can do this market mapping project for you for succession planning, for identifying those future leaders, for really mapping the marketplace, any leadership or skills gaps that, that we uncover that we think would be valuable to have within your organization. The way that they, they've structured the pricing is usually they'll charge around 15 to 25% of what the total search fee would normally be. So say, for example, if your typical search fee is $100,000, charge 15 to 25% of that and apply that towards the market mapping assignment or market mapping project itself. So for example, a market mapping project, if you're pitching it to a prospect, if you're pitching it to a client, would be roughly around 15 to 25,000. And again, since market mapping is really just that entire research phase of a search from just extended out through the course of six months, um, a lot of search firms kind of, if that market mapping 
project or market, market mapping assignment turns into a full-blown search, we'll then apply that market mapping fee as kind of a down payment to the search. So at the end of the day, you've done this market mapping project, you've gotten paid for it, you know, 15, 25,000, and then the search firm can apply that 15 to 25,000 to the actual search fee. So again, if your search fee is 100,000, you get 25,000 upfront for just doing this market mapping project. And then this extra 75,000 on a retainer over the course of three months until placement, um, it's, in the grand scheme, it is the total of one, you know, search fee, but you're just kind of spacing out the work and kind of spacing out the um, the opportunity over the course of six months, seven months, eight months, that sort of thing. So that's a little bit about market mapping. Again, everything that we've talked about today in terms of building out a marketing strategy, in terms of target market lists, identifying your specialization and who's a good fit and who's a not a good fit in terms of that BANT acronym that we talked about earlier. Um, all of this can be applied to any additional pre-search service offering that you offer. And again, those pre-search service offerings are really a way to get yourself in the door, get yourself in front of a client and establish and build that credibility of that trusted advisor relationship. At a much kind of lower um, investment level from a client perspective. And, and it kind of really sets the groundwork for the entire relationship moving forward. So Scott, that's a lot about marketing, market mapping, working with search firms, targeting clients, that sort of thing. Um, so how do you put all of this together? Sure. So um, we've talked a lot about kind of the methodologies and the processes here. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about, well, how do you actually do it? What's the technology that you need to, to kind of get this done? And yes, I suppose you could, uh, you could do things with pencil and paper. Um, you could probably get a little more sophisticated, use Excel or Google Sheets or something. Um, but we often see that um, search firms really of all size, they get value out of using some sort of um, executive search platform. And you might, you might say, well, this is all business development. I could just get a CRM. There's plenty of CRMs are out there. Mm -hmm. but, but we think there's a lot of value in doing this kind of work in the same tool that you do your searches in. I mean, much of what we're talking about is, is, you know, establishing your area of specialization, which is based on your past work, you know, tracking these relationships, clients become um, prospects, they become candidates and candidates become clients. Um, so having all this kind of information in one place is very valuable. Indeed, it is a, a founding pillar of clockwork. Um, and indeed part of our origin story. Our CEO and founder, he was an executive recruiter. He was at a, a sizable search firm and um, he, he, they used the executive search platform even to, to do their searches. And he realized that, hey, if I need to find more work, it's based on the, the good work that I already do. It's the, it's the first place and the best place to really look. So it's, it's a core pillar of clockwork. Um, I'd also like to mention that one of the distinctions of clockwork is that it is purpose built for executive search. Um, and what I mean by that is the simplest way to describe it is it's uh, a project first or project led approach versus um, just tracking applicants or something like that. Um, just like you have a specialization, um, you know, you fit into those five categories. Every search project should fit in those five categories. And indeed, when you use Clockwork, it asks you, um, hey, you know, what is the seniority? What is the department? It asks these things. And that is for the reason that later when you need to find these projects so you can figure out where to, to look for work later, um, you can search and you can bring up all those projects and, and boom, you've, you've got the very beginnings of your, your target market list. So a lot of what we've talked about, you know, builds upon each other. And that's that's really why having it in one place is is key. Um, a couple other things I just want to touch on. Um, another aspect of clockwork, we have configurable projects again with that project first or project led approach. Um, 
being we've we've put a lot of work into making projects configurable you can even set up an internal project um, let's say you do cfo searches in the bay area you can put all the cfos you know in that project and it becomes kind of a, a an internal candidate pool for you to use and when it's time for you to take on another search that looks like that you got to jump start um, so that's that's really um, the key there um, I would like to actually touch on client collaboration. It's kind of a, a, uh, an area that I always love talking about. I know in this industry, there is some hesitation around opening your projects up to clients, but, but consider something even like um, talent or, or market mapping. Um, imagine using client collaboration with that for a minute. Yes, you could send them a static PDF, but you're, you're trying to win work with them if you actually share an interactive um, list of candidates with them, one in which they can leave notes and leave comments on, um, it not only makes the experience for them better, but it provides a lot of insight to you in terms of whether or not you're gonna win the search project. If they leave notes like, hey, this candidate looks great, I'd love to talk to them if this goes to search, you're probably gonna win that project. So there's actually an opportunity um, I think that's very powerful with client collaboration, even at the, the most earliest stages of search, even with things like um, talent mapping and market mapping. Um, and then lastly, data management. Obviously, a lot of what we've talked about today um, requires good, clean data. I actually think there's something very magical that happens here when you put all these together. If um, you're leveraging your past work um, to find new work, if you're doing these market mapping projects, um, if you are building talent pools, these configurable projects in Clockwork, um, if you are inviting clients to, to view some of this data, then human nature is gonna actually um, encourage you to make sure the data is clean. And over time, your database is gonna get more and more powerful and more and more valuable. And so I want to kind of end on that thought that there really is a lot of value in having um, an executive search platform. And uh, we we hope that uh, everyone agrees on that. So <laughs> with that, uh, let's open it up to some questions. Hopefully, Thaddeus, you were looking at some questions while I was uh, talking about the, the technology there. Um, Let's see what we've got. Yeah, so we have one question for a new for search firm that's starting from scratch with no references or no past clients. How do we begin to create a target marketing list? That's a great question. And um, first, hopefully um, they're coming from somewhere. So <laughs> um, if you're if you're coming say from you know corporate recruiting or maybe you worked at a another search firm much larger um then hopefully you do have some established relationships you do have contacts to use the old school term you have a rolodex right and so even though you don't have projects to look at you can look at your contacts and you can see what industry they're in you know what seniority level they're in and start to use that as kind of a proxy if you will for um, you know, what is my area of specialization? I think that's an easy shortcut. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that if you're kind of starting out as a new search firm, which I've worked with those search firms in the past, again, you know what you do really, really well. So look to those organizations, look to those geographies, look to those stakeholders, those functions, and those seniorities that you specialize in. And that's really where you're gonna start kind of building that target market list. Um, and again, for new search firms starting out specifically, the best way to kind of get your reputation out there, like we talked about, is establishing credibility through your marketing channels. So LinkedIn, again, is a really easy one to do. You know, your connections go with you from LinkedIn, from role to role to role. If you leave Corn Ferry and you start your own thing, um, all those connections are still going to be a part of your network on LinkedIn, which puts yourself and your expertise directly in front of them. So really using and tapping into those established networks that you may not have thought of um, is another great way to kind of start building that credibility, creating those touch points so that when you do reach out, people will say, oh, 
he used to do work at, at Corn Ferry, that kind of thing. And now he's on his own. Great to see that, you know. So it's really establishing those touch points outside of kind of the traditional marketing, you know, channels that you think of that can also help create that community, create that target list, create that kind of client um, facing expertise that you'll need to kind of build yourself up and build your reputation up if you're starting out fresh from scratch. Let's see, another question is, do you think LinkedIn is an up-to-date source? 65 to 70% of people have their profile up to date, but do you think CEOs, CFOs, and C-level board members have a LinkedIn profile? Um, I would say, do all have a LinkedIn profile? Probably not. There probably are some out there. But I do think in today's world, there is a lot of pressure um, for people to keep their profile up to date. Um, and I think, you know, whether it's the pandemic and people working remote for a while, getting used to Zoom, um, I think certainly people are getting used to, to LinkedIn and that kind of being the, the de facto professional social media network, let's call it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that's definitely the, the trend. Um, but I would also like to remark that uh, we give LinkedIn as the example, because I think it's one that everybody's familiar with, but there are other sources out there. Um, and I think really, if um, you want to drop those in, really the methodology here still, still holds up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our next question is kind of dovetails off of that comment, Scott. Many of our clients are family businesses that are not actually on LinkedIn. So any thoughts on how to connect with those that are not necessarily intentionally discoverable on social media? And just kind of thinking from my past experience, yes, LinkedIn is one tool in your toolbox for marketing, but it's not everything. So having an established website with proper SEO terms baked into your copy and building out pages where people can identify what you specialize in, who you are, what your past experience is, LinkedIn is not the be all end all of your marketing strategy. So you have these different players within your marketing toolkit, like a website, like email marketing, um, that you can also use to reach out to those prospects, those clients, and, and kind of pursue them and position yourself in front of them in that way. Now, in terms of email marketing specifically, you don't want to be too aggressive in terms of, of your marketing strategy, um, but being able to craft a really well-written email and identify the pain points that your clients are facing on a regular basis and then responding to those in email marketing format is a really powerful way to use email marketing. So instead of kind of just blasting out, you know, we do XYZ as this search firm, talk to their pain points, understand what they need from a trusted advisor, from a search firm, what's missing in their process and why should you use them? That's the value that you bring as a search firm. That's the value that you bring as a search consultant. And all of that should permeate every single aspect of your marketing strategy. Yeah, and one, one thing I would like to add there is I, th I think it is a fair insight that, yes, LinkedIn um, is, is stronger in some industries than others. Certainly, if you're in an industry with a lot of family um, businesses, um, yes, you, that probably LinkedIn is, is not going to be as strong there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also why your past work is also so important. If you've done a search for, for one of those companies in that industry, um, part of your past work should be um, identifying who the competitors are. And so hopefully um, over time, um, your, your target market list gets better and better, even, even without using something like LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. We have another question, um, which is more kind of geared towards that market mapping operation and process in terms of a search firm, Scott. And this person says, do you recommend any products or templates to market map and produce something of quality that's not just a PDF download or an Excel document with a list of names and everything along those lines? Are there any products out there that can really support this whole market mapping process in terms of working with your clients specifically? 
Um, well, I, I think Clockwork is actually a great, great product to, to help with that. Um, as I kind of alluded to, you know, you there's you can certainly set up a project in Clockwork to for for market mapping, and I think sharing um, that information it's it's highly configurable even on what you share. Um, you know, sometimes there's hesitation about doing a market map project that oh they could just take all these contact information and just go run and do the search themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but in clockwork, you, you have a lot of control over um, what is visible. And uh, like I said, I think the, the collaboration side of it um, becomes super powerful. So um, Thaddeus, you've, you've done some, some mark mapping uh, work with some clients through Retainly. What, what other tools have you seen out there? Yep. So obviously clockwork is a really great one. Um, obviously uh you know google sheets and that kind of thing that you can create a document that you can share interactively with the client that's also super helpful um i've also seen search firms use monday.com but that's a little bit more rigid in terms of tax tasks and that sort of thing um really the best one that i've seen like we talked about earlier is clockwork because it has all those configurations you can do out of the box basically and set up a market mapping project template over and over and over again, and then use that client view, that client engagement, the client collaboration side of the tool um, to really establish your credibility, but also show your work. Transparency is a big challenge that search firms face because they wanna keep their data, they wanna keep their candidates, they wanna keep all that information secret from their clients because you know, potentially clients could could just directly go to those people and you're essentially handing over a list. When you're collaborating with a client on a much deeper level as a search firm and as a search consultant, they trust you and they know that you are the one that's really building the relationship with these candidates. Um, so again, kind of that collaboration side, especially specifically for market mapping is really the best way to kind of transition the relationship and the engagement from market mapping into an, an eventual search because of that transparency, because of that collaboration. They know what they're getting now up front when they move into a search and they know what to expect. So that's really the value of bringing market mapping from a search perspective to the table early on and kind of establishing that transparency, establishing that that relationship with the client at the very beginning to be very collaborative. And the rest just kind of follows, follows suit after that. We have another question that is about what have you guys found to be the most successful tool to make the initial contact? I feel like we have a great story to tell, but our challenge with getting that message out there. Um, Thaddeus, I'll let you go first. And then I'm <laughs> yeah, sure I, think I, I will a, opine on it. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of, of search firms struggle with this. I really do. And I see it on a regular basis. And really the best way to kind of demonstrate your expertise and, and um, show what you do and how well you do it is through all of your content. So that's thought leadership, it's blog articles that you can post on your website, um, it's eBooks and really kind of using eBooks or white papers as an educational tool for your clients that you're pitching or that you're potentially looking to work with because executive search is such a distinct and niche area of recruitment in general, a lot of clients don't really know how it works, how it should work, that kind of thing. So being able to provide those resources through thought leadership, written thought leadership that they can easily access through a website, through downloads, something along those lines, being able to use that information and use those channels to build up your credibility and build up your, your search firm and talk about what you do in terms of specialization, clients that you've worked with, um, current or past searches you've done, placement announcements actually are really, really beneficial because a client can log into LinkedIn or see on your website that you just placed a CEO at a startup company and say, okay, this person, this search firm just placed this candidate that we were looking to hire. 
you know, how do we get that level of talent? How can we start working with the search firm specifically? So it's really kind of looking to your marketing materials, but in that digital space, not necessarily your pitch deck, not necessarily kind of the case studies you attach to an email and you send off, readily available information that's written that people can access, have time to consume, have time to focus on, have time to spend, really learning about your organization, learning about your search firm, learning about how you work with clients, the type of searches that you do is really kind of the best way. And again, to set the groundwork for establishing that relationship. Scott, do you have any additional thoughts? I do. You know, I, I want to add that, that we, we actually try to do the same thing um, ourselves. Um, our, our account managers, um, they're reaching out, they're trying to build a relationship with you, just like you're trying to build a relationship with, with your potential clients. And really from a marketing side, we do, we do many of the similar kind of things. And we've experimented on this plenty. Um, if we reach out to all of you and just say, Hey, would you like a demo? Um, <laughs> you're probably going to say no. <laughs> um, but if we if we reach out and we say, hey, you know, we wrote this ebook on the eight stages of successful retained search, um, you guys will probably check it out, and and hopefully you'll learn something, and hopefully there's some insights we share, and and uh, you know maybe over time um, you'll come to realize that hey, there really is some value in having some software that does this or better software that does this, um, and and you'll reach out to us. So mm -hmm. I know that's maybe not the the best answer, but you know, I, I've done B2B marketing for a lot of companies and, and, you know, frankly, establishing credibility, taking the high road approaches like that in the end, um, always went out. So mm -hmm. hopefully that's some, some, uh, life experience I've shared there. <laughs> Scott, before we jump off, there's one more question that's kind of about a pre-search service offering. That's not market mapping, which I would like to address. And the question is, have you had experience offering a lost leader service for free to get a relationship established? For example, like creating a, a nine box analysis of the leaders or review of their succession plan and really kind of that that kind of foray or using that pre-search service offering or offering that pre-search service offering to a search to a client specifically from a search firm is really kind of that assessment leadership advisory space that you can tap into as a search firm. So go to your client and use it as kind of a, a foray to kicking off a search look at the leadership team and really assess what skills are there. It's kind of part of market mapping without building out the entire marketing list or the entire um, candidate list and kind of talent pool. So it's taking a very small part of that market mapping service and then applying it from a leadership advisory, leadership development perspective. So if your search firm does offer some sort of onboarding or leadership advisory or learning and development arm of your business, that's another tool and another service you can use to get yourself in the door for prospective clients and prospective companies. Help them understand what they're missing because if they can't pinpoint it, they don't know what's wrong. Help them understand what skills are needed to understand why employees may be, may be leaving, why they're losing talent, that kind of thing. Help them understand what the reputation of that company is within the marketplace to help them attract talent in a more effective and impactful way. So there are services, there are parts of market mapping that you as a search firm can offer at the very beginning of establishing a relationship. And again, like we talked about, it's all about building that expertise, building that relationship and really kind of opening the door to your clients and having them realize, wow, why did we never work with a search firm before? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I, I appreciate um, sharing that idea because I, I do think that's another way to kind of get the foot in the door. Mm -hmm. That's, we have a so couple think, more questions, but I think that we'll follow up with those individually. Yes, um, we're, we're at time and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We're um, so glad that so many of you joined us today. Um, we will follow up on um, any questions we didn't cover. 
And again, the recording will be sent out. Um, a link will be sent over email um, shortly. So thank you again for, for joining us today. Um, and happy hunting. <laughs> thank you, everyone.